talk to you and to uh, 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 answer your questions uh, when I'm done um, about what, how do you do this, why do you do it, how can we pull people together in new and different ways that let us build a better country a better, in a better world. Um, I want to talk to you about some of the things that happened in the Dean campaign to give you all a real sense of the difference of the kind of campaign that this means. Um, again, television is a one-way medium. Um, tons of candidates and parties go out every day uh, for women can get news coverage, uh, which uh, I know is sometimes tough, but I, I'm happy that, that you're on television today. Um, the, but it's a one-way meeting. Uh, no one can talk back to me right now. Uh, I mean, it's sitting at home. Um, if we were, the internet is a, a con allows a conversation, um, and that's important. And so, one of the things that happened in the game campaign, one of the things that you can do you can't create ownership of the party on television um, or candidates. You can do it using the internet. Uh, and I want to explain that. In the Dean campaign, we were very proud of ourselves because we, we created the first campaign to create 50 signs, you know, Iowa for Dean, New Hampshire for Dean, California for Dean, three state. Um, and that was the but what was it was we put them on the internet and said that you didn't have to go to campaign headquarters and figure out where the campaign headquarters was in your state that might be 300 miles away. All you had to do is go to the internet, download your sign, print it on your printer, or take it to a, a Kinko's or some uh, uh, computer shop and have print it out. And we were really proud we announced that. And uh, minutes after we announced that on the internet, um, the first comment on our blog, our web blog, our website was, from a person in Puerto Rico. And uh, it said, Joe could be your <laughs> I was not the first person to call me that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there, there are 50 states and you have those signs, but Puerto Rico votes for the Democratic presidential nomination as well. And how could you be so stupid as to not have a Puerto Rico for Dean sign? So I screamed out my door to my webmaster, Nico Belli, and said, Nico, you know, cut and paste Iowa and, and make it Puerto Rico for Dean sign and put it up. So he did three minutes later. And we had eight thank yous from Puerto Rico. Literally eight comments, thank you, thank you, I'm downloading, thank you. The ninth comment was from a gentleman in London uh, who said, Joe Trippi, you're an idiot. <laughs> Because there's five or six million Americans who live abroad uh, who will be voting uh, for president, and you do not have an Americans abroad for Dean sign. And so I screamed out my door to the webmaster and said, Nico, you know, fix that. And he did. And uh, minutes later, the first thank you came from a woman in Spain. Why, I tell you the story not because what was important about this was not, um, I mean, it was cool that all this happened in eight minutes and that um, we could fix all these things. But in, a, in the old top-down campaign where you just print them, you send them to the headquarters, and if the people could find them, find them, they couldn't tough. There's no way, and so trust me, I've been in those campaigns. Uh, uh, I've, I've worked in those too. There's no way that the people in Puerto Rico would even know that there were signs, let alone, and, and let alone the campaign find out that it didn't happen. I mean, it didn't do that, but that was a mistake. It, this London, Spain, forget about it. There's no way, no way on the planet that that would have been figured out or solved. That was important, but what was really more important was that everybody involved out there, everybody who was reading our site and the growing community of, of game supporters recognized immediately that this campaign was different, that this one was listening to them. It was actually letting them talk back and actually saying, and actually listening to people telling them they were, we were wrong and saying, thank you, you're right, you made a mistake, thank you for solving that problem for us. They understood that they actually owned 
the candidacy in a way that nobody had ever owned a presidential candidate in the past. I mean, maybe the corporations had owned one, but people were actually owning this campaign. And that's the legacy and I think the future of the Green Party of being that kind of an effort for the people who own the party, um, other people can own the other parties. Um, the, the one moment um, I think that illustrates this, and uh, there's some, the, the most though was in, uh, I came up with a really crazy idea at some point. I decided that, uh, well, no, I, I think there's something illustrative about this too. We, we had sent out an email to Austin, Texas, saying that we're going to come to a to a, uh, Austin in a couple weeks, and we only had 482 people on our email list. And uh, we thought, well, we'll email those 482 people, we'll tell them about the park we want to meet them in, and, you know, we're lucky if half of them show up, there'll be 200 people. Um, we, we got to the park, and there were 3,200 people in the park. And we knew we didn't send out 3,200 emails, we sent out 480. Uh, but being curious, we asked people what happened. What happened was two of the original people we sent that email to decided that, uh, to send out another email saying, hey, if he's coming in two weeks, why don't we get together at my house and talk about what we can do to get others to come. So uh, 100 people showed up to this sort of spontaneous uh, organizing event uh, that the campaign knew nothing about. And they decided they were going to leaflet the entire Latino community of uh, Boston, Texas. And, uh, and go door to door in 50 different precincts. And anyway, long story short, they actually get 3,200 people there. Um, and half of whom did not own computers. These were uh, from poor areas of Boston where they, these other people have leafleted and, and encouraged people to show up to hear the Dean message. Um, so with, with that lesson in mind, I decided that what we're going to do is, hey, what happens if we tell Seattle we're coming and give them a month and tell Portland we're coming and give them a month? And we, we squish it all into four days, and in four days we go to ten cities, and just whatever happens, happens. We're not going to send teams to build crowds or anything. We're just going to show up and see what happens. And not only are we going to go on this tour of 10 cities in four days, we're going to tell the entire nation that while we're on it, we're going to raise a million dollars over the internet. Um, many people on the Dean staff thought this was crazy. And having done it, I can tell you it was. But uh, having lived through it anyway. Uh, but what happened was we, we went to those 10 cities and we showed up in Seattle, 15,000 people were in the square. Uh, Portland, 5,000, I mean, it was just the most unbelievable thing that you've ever seen. It was people organizing, a decentralized campaign of people organizing themselves, holding their own leafleting, building their own, um, own growth. And, um, but, by the last day, the fourth day, uh, we were no, we weren't going to make a million dollars. That was not happening. This is the first time anybody tried to do something like that. Um, we weren't going to make a million dollars, and uh, we were actually somewhere just shy of nine hundred thousand, with about an hour left to go in the tour. And it doesn't take a mathematician or a rocket scientist to figure out that if it's taking you three days to raise. $858,000 likelihood of raising the rest of it in 10% more or so in, in, a, in an hour is not good. Uh, but my, uh, my webmaster uh, called me up again. I was on a cell phone in, in a New York deli. Our last event was going to be in New York City and the press was really angry with us because we hadn't fed them yet that day. Um, so we decided, okay, we'll give them a break, we'll stop, we'll feed them in a New York deli and then we'll go to the event. And uh, my cell phone rang, and it was my webmaster who said, Joe, there's this interesting idea from a guy in Tucson, Arizona on our website. I said, what is it? He said, well, he says he gave $25 yesterday, and he gave $25 this morning, 
He gave $25 at 3 o'clock this afternoon that he's just sickened with the, with the idea that we won't make it. And he realizes that we have to make one more push and he can't really afford it. But if Howard Dean will carry a red baseball bat on the stage tonight and hold it up to the television cameras and say, you did it, if we'll agree to do that, he's going to get $25 more right now. And, and, and there's a whole bunch of other people saying, yeah, yeah, that's a cool idea. If he'll do that, I'll get more too. So desperate men doing desperate things. <laughs> I told Negro to please post immediately that uh, Howard Dean says that he, you know, that uh, I talked to the governor and I did, and he said, sure, of course. And uh, and so he told uh, he told uh, uh, me to give the word that we would do that, and we put that word out, and uh, we immediately got the bus and drove to the to that last rally. And we get to that rally and there's 18,000 people in Bryant Park, New York. There, there's this massive jumbotron screen that we, TV screen that we had rented uh, for the event. And I'm looking up, it has a website on it, and I'm looking up on it and the numbers are going 932,000, 948,000, 963,000, 972,000, just spinning out of control. And at 10 o'clock, it says one million three thousand dollars. They did it. And as soon as it hits one million three thousand dollars, the announcers got, you know, sense to me to swing out. Ladies and gentlemen, the next president of the United States, Howard Dean. Howard, hearing the magic words that he's going to be the next president of the United States, starts going towards the stage. And, um, uh, and he doesn't have a red baseball bat because I had sent a staffer out just an hour before somewhere late at night in New York City to try to find one. And, uh, and out of the corner of my eye, I see Matt Vogel, my staffer that I sent to do, is running with everything he's got down the street in New York with his red baseball hat. <laughs> and he tosses it up to Howard Dean on the stage, he grabs it and says to the television cameras, you did it. And now, I don't believe that most of America had a clue what Howard Dean was holding that baseball bat. You admit. Because we this was really when we were just starting to come on, on to the scene. But the hundreds of thousands of people who, could, who had been part of that tour, who had given money during that tour, who had been reading our website all the way through this, and had known that just 45, 50 minutes ago, one of them, 3,000 miles away, had come up with the idea of him holding a baseball bat and saying he did it. Not me, not the press secretary, not the staff, not some brilliant consultant, but one of them. And then not the campaign manager, not a brilliant consultant, not the staff were implementing it, but the candidate himself, the candidate for President of the United States of America, was doing it. That is, that is the kind of ownership that average people deserve to have of their leaders and of the party and on policy and on issues, and they deserve to be able to come together like that in common cause for the common good of their country. Bible or some other document 
uh, boards of the government, but it was it was only the very wealthy who could afford to pay a scribe to handwrite the book, their copy of their book. That's the only way anybody had the written word um, or scientific knowledge, any kind of knowledge was contained only by the wealthy who could afford to have their own personal copy written for them. And then all of a sudden this printing press happens and all hell breaks loose. Why? Because people can read stuff they weren't allowed to read before or couldn't afford to read before. People can write pamphlets um, like Thomas Paine did in the, United, in the early colonies and incite uh, people to rise up in revolution. Things changed dramatically. Power shifted in amazing ways. While we've lived in a one-way communication system for since then, and the this new technology is that it's a new printing press, a new multi-way printing press on steroids. And it is going to disrupt every institutional lockstep, top down, doing business the old way, party, corporation, institution that does not understand how this is going to change. And the one the people are the one who are going to be the beneficiary just as they were when the printing press happened. And that is um, the thing that I think you need to think about. And you, I know you probably are. Um, uh, but how do we give, how does this party enable the people to make the change we need to make? How do we empower the people to make the change? Not just uh, versus the other parties that tend to be about, but the established parties, not, they're not bad people, they just get caught in the system of. Uh, we're trying to empower people to make change. They're trying to stay in power and make sure change doesn't happen. Why? Because that's the only way they stay in power. So, so, and that's to them becomes the most important thing: is staying in power, not not empowering people. In fact, empowering people is scary because that that may mean they are us. They need to go. So, what what I think that's about. Uh, that's why I think the, the Green Party, again, being a completely bottom-up um, creation from the bottom, and, under, and, and is, is, is sitting right at the right moment for what's happened in terms of this changing empowerment of the bottom. Um, and how we, and I think every party, the, the greatest thing that could happen for democracy is for every party to return to to the people and return itself to the to, uh, to empowering people and not uh, and not seeking power, but you know well, it, 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 that's easily said. Um, it, uh, I even have talked to people in the established parties and they seem to be very earnest and interested in this new change, and I think they mean it. And then they get locked into the, the system and they can't they can't change it. I think uh, it's parties like the Greens that have the real possibility of making it actually happen and empowering people again. Now, there's one thing I want to end on before I open it up to, to questions, but I think it also helps uh, understand what I'm talking about. Uh, there's a more conservative blogger in the United States, Glenn, Glenn Reynolds, uh, who has a book out um, called uh, uh, An Army of Davids. And uh, his contention, of course, is that, 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 that if you go back to the story of David and Goliath, is that Goliath was this big giant, and um, you know David was the little guy with the slingshot of the rock, and he slays Goliath. And then in this new world, what the internet and cell phones and our ability to connect with each other is actually creating is the world's had a ton of Goliaths for a long time. I mean, major corporations, maybe government institutions, all these. Um, uh, Goliaths out there, uh, major parties, uh, Goliaths. Uh, what the net and everything is doing is creating an army of Davids for change. What the institutions need to understand, what parties need to think about, is are they going to be trying to remain Goliaths? Without a choice. You could be Goliath or you could be the slingshot for the army of Davids. 
too many of the established institutions and parties will try to be remain the Elias. Green Party and the parties of success and the institutions that will succeed in the future will try to be a slingshot for the people, to help the people empower the people to create the change that they want to make and that we so need to make. And that is uh, what we must endeavor to do every day, uh, to empower people to make the change that uh, we need to make in society, the, the demands. You can't have democracy without real participation of people. Um, and that also means there's responsibility with, with people. They've got to decide whether they want to keep doing it the old way or whether they want to try something new. And I think it was Einstein who said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Um, and if you look at the established parties in most countries, that's what the people have been doing. So either those parties reform or people understand that it's a certain form of insanity to continue to do the same thing and not see change. Um, even against great odds at times of the sea chains, and over time you will change things. And that um, is the message that I wanted to uh, uh, impart to you today. Uh, I might love to welcome, uh, open up to, uh, to questions, uh, or if uh, there's some particular thing that I've said in the past few days that somebody thinks I should talk to the whole group about, I'd be more than willing to do that as well. Thank you. Oh, I see. No,
then you know if they run circles around me. You might be able to run circles around some of them. I don't know, but they, you know it's basically we're in a new era where uh, we used to look to 59-year-old mentors to sort of show us the ropes and how to. You know, you need to find 19-year-old mentors in the party that, that can do this. And, you know, Generation Green would be an incredible thing to start, um, at giving them the authority and the ability to build their own Generation Green um, uh, campaign uh, uh, and, and literally turning it over to them and learning from them as they come up with these tools or it would be a good, a good, good, good thing to think about as well. Don't forget to mention your name, please. Hi, I'm Steve Disney, and I'm from Vancouver. Um, two things. I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about community and its ability to raise funds and how it can support the community with, about that. And I'd also like you to talk a little bit about how your campaign handled uh, dissidents and troublemakers. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, the, first, the first part of that is, uh, look, the, the, I, I should have mentioned that in the body of my talk. Uh, this is a, the, the, the mistake that most people made in thinking about the Dean campaign, and the, the only thing anybody ever wants me to talk about when I talk about the Dean campaign is how did you get, particularly in politics, is how did you raise all that money? Because every party and everybody can even wants a lot of money. And what I tell everybody is, if you try to build a party or, or uh, an infrastructure around uh, raising money uh, and using the internet to do that, you will fail at it. Uh, that the most important thing that you can do is to empower and build a community online. I mean, we're talking the online sense. If you build a community in which people participate and believe they have input and, uh, and really do have input and, and feel like they have ownership, the money will follow. You will be able to raise, like in the Dean campaign, uh, you know, we raised uh, unbelievable amounts of money. Uh, but it wasn't how we, we didn't set out to build a community to raise the money. Um, if you do that, and it's pretty simple. I mean, look, if, if you're going to have a website or, or a list where every time you email to them, um, all you're doing is asking for money, and then you tell somebody, you know what, could you do us a favor and tell your best friends to join us? Well, what? The last 10 emails I've gotten from these guys just asking for money. If I ask my best friend Mark to join, He's going to be so mad at me because the only thing he gets from these people is direct mail solicitation or email solicitations asking for money. You destroy your ability to grow. Um, this is about building a community. <laughs> the second part of the question was um, how your campaign. Oh, this it is. Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, and this actually gets to the whole community thing. We we made a decision. We were not going to censor uh, anybody on our site. I mean, you could come on and comment and say whatever you wanted, and that included uh, profanity. We, you know, we had a thing saying, "Please don't use profanity and uh, be civil, etc." But uh, we understood that, that, that we were just not going to censor people, and um, and we were terrified about this. I mean. What, what are we going to do when Carl Rove or one of our opponents, six, you know, pays 20 people to sit in front of the machines and just try to wreak havoc or say bad things about our dean on our site? And um, we had no real solution. I mean, there were 60 of us in the headquarters and we couldn't figure out how we were going to deal with it. You know, but we were terrified that it was going to happen. And then one day, um, Somebody had clearly, in a Word document, spent hours typing Dean sucks, Dean sucks, Dean sucks, over and over again, and copied it into our comment section. So you've got somebody, a real Dean supporter, asking, hey, is Howard Dean going to be in Los Angeles anytime soon? And the next comment is Dean sucks, Dean sucks, Dean sucks, Dean, all the way down. And then 40 pages later, yes, I think he'll be in Los Angeles Thursday. <laughs> Well, needless to say, this was, we were a little bit worried, we couldn't figure out, we, we did not take it down, we left it. Um, and what happened was pretty amazing. The, our own supporters, one of them said, um, you know, guy, if you do that one more time, I want you to follow this link. Um, because when you click on this link, it's a new web page. 
And that web page allows everybody here to give money to Howard Dean every time you say something bad about him. <laughs> and you can go over here and look at the thermometer and see how much you're raising him every time you do that. <laughs> so, so the, the first time he does it, I go check that page and $10,000 is coming in. And, he, you know, and the detractor, our supporter is saying, hey, it's, you don't have to go check, I'll tell you. You just raised him $10,000, it's in the comment section. And the next time it was something like $100,000. Now, let me tell you, no one from that point on ever said anything or disrupted our site again. And because like Carl Rove or the Kerry campaign, I mean, whether it was orchestrated or whether it was a real, you know, just somebody out there, they all knew you were going to raise us more money than it was worth to say, to, to be, you know, that kind of disruptive. Now, that really kind of upset me as a campaign manager um, because, you know, it turned out to be one of the best fundraisers that we ever had. <laughs> I, I do have to confess to having a temporary, you know, four or five minutes of insanity where I fantasized about sitting in my office typing Dean Sucks, Dean Sucks. <laughs> but, um, but I did. And, uh, but what it tells you is that, the, what I'll tell you is, is what's amazing about this is how the, the sense of community that gets built up. The community that you build is going to be better at policing itself than you could ever dream of. I mean, I, I, I can't, you know, it's just amazing. Um, and, and the other thing that I learned, um, and it's useful, and that the major, the other, like I said, the institutional parties, the old line parties should think about is, the one thing that you've absolutely learned, I learned for sure, is that when you have 650,000 people out there who are really paying attention and trying to help you with good ideas, um, they're much smarter than the 60 people at national headquarters in Burlington. Uh, that brain power, the ability to be three steps back and spot that we didn't have a Puerto Rico sign, or, that, or how we can solve this problem of the guys saying this on their site, and one of them, one of those 650,000 minds out there, will come up with a creative solution. That, 60 people who are in the fight in the trench with the bombs coming in at headquarters, you know, and the phone calls from the press, and it's never going to come up with. And so, uh, and particularly the staff, uh, we had 60 people, but I know what your staff is, and I don't think you're there yet, but I can do more. You know, we have to but I'm saying, so you have to rely on that community. That community, uh, I, we had a, a, a saying inside the Dean campaign that we never really let out because we knew everybody would think we were crazy uh, for saying it, but we, we believe that running for president was the equivalent of uh, jumping out a 16-story building and believing in all your heart that the American people would catch you before you hit the cement. And um, if you run that way, I mean, if you trust the community of Canadians that way, if there was a party that trusted them, to know, yeah, this is, I'm putting everything at risk here, but damn it, they'll catch me. They will. They absolutely will. You know? And our leaders don't believe that. Locked. 
uh, from all those eyes who went out with very smart people usually try to figure out how to hack their way around it and see, see other stuff and then get it around. So I mean, I think they're, they're, they're going to make that fight. On the U.S. Uh, or sort of, you know, our side of the planet, um, there's a part of me, I, I'm very concerned about it, and I, and, I, and I want to try to stop all the different things that people are, the net neutrality and things that are, are happening out there. Um, but I've got to be honest with you, there's a piece of me that wants them to do it. Because I think they would unleash sheer, they, 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 so many people now know that the information is power and that, that, that it's changing and empowering them in, in amazing ways. Um, that I actually believe if they did that, it would be one of the dumbest things that any government has ever tried to do in a free democratic society. <laughs> the people, the people will rise up and And so the piece of me, yeah, I mean, I'm, it's like the same fantasy I had about Dean sucks, Dean sucks. I don't really want that to happen, but I don't, I, mean, I really do not fear it either. I, you know, I, I relish the, the working with you and everybody in this room and everybody in the United States to fight that, uh, uh, to, to, you know, let them try, because we will not let that happen. And, and they will see that that would be something I think that would actually grow the bottom up very, very fast. So, um, where I fear it, I think it's important and we have to keep monitoring and make sure everybody's aware that these efforts are going on. Um, um, I've got more faith in people at the bottom that will we'll stop it. Thank you. I just want to say I think we probably will have only time for the questions uh, for the people that are at the mic. So uh, I will take one over here. Please just mention your name. Cameron Wigmore from Grinnell, Alberta. Hello, Mr. Tricky. Um, I'm wondering about uh, your thoughts on websites of political parties versus weblogs, or in, including weblogs. Uh, Real-time feedback, you mentioned, was uh, one of the most wonderful assets soliciting for a response and then getting that and then responding real time. Uh, how do you propose that someone would do that with a weblog? It's easy to one person with a weblog, uh, with websites. Um, do you think that, that that culture existed and was waiting for uh, something to plug into for feedback, or do you think that it was because it was cultivated that it occurred? Uh, I think two things. I think one is uh, people are desperate to be part of the common good and part of the community. Desperate. Uh, and that the, the the institutions uh, and the one-way medium of television um, have fragmented us in so many ways that there is that people have lost their what I would call our traditional sense of community, neighborhood, those kind of things. People want to be part of something bigger than themselves. And in a trans that's a whole transactional thing, in a transactional plan, like where can you be part of something bigger than yourself? And where can you provide any feedback? In, you know, that, that, that where people where somebody at that huge airline or huge, you know, actually, you actually think they heard you and actually going to do something about it? No, I mean, come on. So, the, what the blog does, and particularly one in a party or one from a candidate, is to have that, to that, there's, great, here's a place I can be in a community. Now, I'm not going to stay, it's not a real one where people are listening to me and, you know, but, the, but I, I'm going to. Um, you know, we had huge success with Block for America. But one of the things I said, and I'll say this today, the greatest thing any one of you can do tomorrow morning, um, as hard as it may be, and if it means going and buying a machine and doing it, start your own weblog. Start it tomorrow. Because if everybody in this room started a weblog and updated it once a day with some interesting story about the environment or something about um, the economy, um, that, and the only people who read it were three or four of your best friends, your mom, uh, and your co uh, one of your favorite co-workers, that's, that's 10, 20 people each. Well, you're starting to create that community. I mean, even though you're, IBM, one of the biggest corporations in the world, 347,000 employees, six months ago decided that it was going to ask every single one of its employees to start a web blog. All 347. You know why? Because if 10 pop people a pop, their community would be communicating with 3.5 million people every day on a daily basis with people who have more credibility than IBM does, right? If you're talking to your mom and your best friend and five other people, and that's all, 
you still have much more credibility than the message that you're going to that corporation is going to send. This is the thing where friends, peer to peer, matters, and where being part of that community matters. And the most important thing you can do is to get in that community, get in that, and create a blog. I